A young engineer is designing a 1500 watt hair dryer and hopes to sell it on the open market. He or she calculates, using science and a lot of testing, that the outlet conditions for optimum hair drying occur with a temperature and velocity of 50 degrees Celsius and 20 meters per second, respectively. Any hotter or faster than that, despite doing a better job of drying, might cause the customer to burn themselves or their hair, which the legal department suggests is a bad thing. The engineer assumes that, under normal conditions, the ambient air will be about 22 degrees Celsius and 100 kilopascals. Because of the stagnant condition of the ambient air and the large size of the intake, the inlet velocity will be negligibly small. Additionally, the body of the hairdryer will be well insulated so as to avoid the whole burning the customer thing. Determine first the mass flow rate of the air through the device, that's how much mass flow rate this can process while consuming 1500 watts and accomplishing the change in kinetic energy and enthalpy required. Secondly, determine the volumetric flow rate at the outlet of the device. And thirdly, the diameter of the outlet, which would yield optimum hair drying conditions. So the first thing I'm going to do is draw an approximate diagram and indicate what I know. So I know conditions at the inlet of the device, and I know conditions at the outlet of the device. I'm going to treat the internal mechanisms as two separate steady flow devices. First a fan, which I'm assuming handles all the change in kinetic energy, and then an electric resistance heater. I'm assuming the fan handles all the change in kinetic energy, and the electric resistance heater handles all the change in enthalpy. Now, of course, in reality, it's a little bit more complicated than that. They aren't going to be that exclusive of one another. But this is sort of like when you're analyzing kinematic motion and you figure out the path of a projectile by considering the x-axis and the y-axis individually. It's not as though it actually traverses only the x-axis and then the y-axis, but breaking it apart into pieces allows you to analyze one piece at a time and bring them together. In the same way, if we assume all the change in kinetic energy happens in the fan and all the change in enthalpy happens in the heater, then we end up at the same result. By treating the work input to the fan as going directly into kinetic energy, we are also accounting for any pressure increases that are actually converted back into kinetic energy inside of a nozzle, say, at like the end of the shape of the hairdryer. If we draw a control volume around the entire thing, it eventually becomes kinetic energy, regardless of which individual conversions happen within the internal mechanisms. Since we're assuming 100% operating efficiency, essentially, it doesn't matter how many conversions occur. Does that make sense? Excellent. So since I have two steady flow devices here, I am going to indicate a state point between them. And that gives me the ability to analyze the fan and the heater individually if I want, but I can also draw a control volume around the entire body. So I have electrical power input to the fan mechanism, and I have electrical power input to the heater. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, but John, Surely the heater should be a heat transfer in, right? Well, it depends on how you draw your control volume. Since I'm drawing my control volume around the body, that means that the energy is crossing my boundary in the form of electrical work. If I drew an energy balance around the heating mechanism itself, then it's entering my control volume in the form of heat transfer. Since both of them are energy rate inputs in my energy balance, it doesn't really matter whether I call it a W or a Q, because it appears as the same term anyway. Then I know the power input of the fan and the power input of the heater have to sum together to 1500 watts. So I'm assuming the velocity at state one is pretty close to zero from the words negligibly small. Now, of course, the velocity at the inlet can't actually be zero or else there would be no mass flow rate 
what we're saying here is that the velocity is so close to zero that when we calculate the kinetic ener energy at the inlet, we're saying a small number squared relative to the outlet velocity squared is basically zero. Another way to think about it is that the kinetic energy at the inlet actually still came from the fan. The fan is pulling the air, so if you expand your control volume out far enough, you're actually grabbing stagnant air. So the change in kinetic energy happens as a result of the fan anyway. Next, we are assuming the temperature at the inlet is about ambient conditions, which we were told were 22 degrees Celsius, and that the pressure is about 100 kilopascals. At the outlet, we have a velocity and a temperature, and then we can assume the pressure at the outlet is still about ambient conditions. Then at state 2, the temperature at state 2 is going to be assumed to be essentially T1 because we're assuming only kinetic energy is increased across the fan. We're assuming all the enthalpy increase happens across the heating element. Similarly, we're saying V2 is approximately equal to V3. Remember, state 2 doesn't really exist. It's the intersection of the Y and X components of my projectile motion. I have the option of setting up a mass balance and an energy balance around a control volume on just the fan, around a control volume on just the heater, or around everything all at once. In the interest of really exploring the example problem to the best of our ability, why don't we try it both ways? So first we'll analyze the fan and the heater together, and then we'll analyze them individually. So I will call control volume, control volume one, just the fan, control volume two, just the heater. And maybe I'll color code that to make it a little bit easier to see. So blue control volume is control volume one. Red control volume is control volume two. And then green, maybe? Green control volume is the whole kit and caboodle. For those mass and energy balances, we're going to be setting up a simplification that looks pretty consistent. So let's just talk through our assumptions one time. First of all, we are assuming steady state operation. The fan has been running long enough to reach steady state. It's not as though we are analyzing the hairdryer being turned on initially. We're saying it's turned on. It has been running long enough that it has reached steady state conditions. I could add to that that it's an open system, even though that's unnecessary. Because that's not really a simplification we're making. The universe is open systems that we simplify in certain circumstances to closed or isolated systems. Next, I'll assume that the air is ideal. So I can use ideal gas properties for the air. Then I can explicitly say change in kinetic energy across control volume 2 is 0 and the change in enthalpy across control volume 1 is 0. That's what allows me to write these properties at state point 2. 
That's not a very good looking CV. Let me try that again. I'm going to assume the changes in potential energy are zero, regardless of how you look at it. And then I will also explicitly assume that there is no power output and that the device is adiabatic. The assumption of adiabatic comes from the phrase well insulated. I was told that the hairdryer was well insulated, which means I'm neglecting any heat transfer through the body of the hairdryer. So with that set of assumptions in place, I can start my control volume analyses. So I will set up three parallel mass balances and energy balances, one on control volume one, one on control volume two, one on control volume three. Beginning with control volume three, for no reason in particular other than that's what I had said first, I have a mass balance and an energy balance. The mass balance starts with change in mass of control volume three is equal to the mass entering minus the mass exiting. The energy balance similarly begins with delta E on control volume three is equal to energy entering minus energy exiting. Because I have steady state operation, it's going to be most convenient for me to divide everything by dt, or rather derivate everything with respect to time, at which point I have dm dt is equal to m dot in minus m dot out. dm dt is zero because it's steady state, and nothing can change with respect to time, including the mass of the control volume. Similarly, on the energy balance, I will divide everything by dt, which again is really just derivating with respect to time, at which point I have dE dt, which is zero. Again, that's the energy of the control volume. And that's zero because of assumption number one is equal to e dot in minus e dot out. Therefore, the mass flow rate entering has to leave I only have one inlet, it's state one. I only have one outlet, it's state three. So I can say m dot one has to equal m dot three, which I can just call m dot for simplicity's sake. Then on the energy balance, I can write e dot in is equal to e dot out. I can clear a little bit more space for myself by scooching over the mass balance, which is the technical term scooch and then I'm going to write e dot in as its full list of possibilities which is e dot in plus work dot in plus the sum in of m dot theta because it's an open system and e dot out could be q dot out could be work dot out and it could be the sum out of m dot theta because I have adiabatic operation, I can neglect the heat transfers because there's no opportunity for work output. I can neglect work out. That leaves me with power input plus the sum of all the mass flow rates entering. There's just one, eight state one, times theta one. Remember that theta consists of enthalpy plus kinetic energy plus potential energy. On the exit side, I have the sum of all the mass flow rates exiting, of which there is one, it is state point three, times theta three, theta is enthalpy plus specific kinetic energy plus specific potential energy. Then I neglect changes in potential energy because of assumption number four. And I'm going to factor out the mass flow rates by bringing this term over to the left, excuse me, over to the right, at which point I have the mass flow rate through the hairdryer multiplied by H3 minus H1 plus 
specific kinetic energy 3 minus specific kinetic energy 1. Therefore, the mass flow rate through the fan, excuse me, through the hairdryer, can be written as the power input divided by H3 minus H1 plus specific kinetic energy 3. Remember, specific kinetic energy is 1 half times velocity squared. So I can write that as V3 squared over 2 minus V1 squared over 2. I can figure out delta H because I know the properties at state 1 and the properties at state 3. I can figure out the change in specific kinetic energy because I know the velocity at state 3 and the velocity at state 1. Velocity at state 1, by the way, is just 0. And the power input was given, 1500 watts. Therefore, if I take 1500 watts divided by the specific change in enthalpy plus the velocity at the exit, which was 20 meters per second squared, divided by 2, and account for the units, I will eventually get a mass flow rate. That's the result of the mass balance and energy balance on control volume number 3. Since I'm going nowhere near control volume order, let's consider control volume 2 next. Control volume 2 was red. And on control volume 2, I'm going to start with a mass balance and an energy balance. The first couple of steps are going to be identical from control volume 3. So I'm going to duplicate those over. And in fact, while I'm at it, I will duplicate those over to control volume 1 as well. And control volume 1 was blue. Then I can go through and change all the subscripts. This is one. This is two. That was, this is T-O-O, -O, not this is T-W-O. This is one also. This one, however, is two, T-W-O. And this one is two. So as a result of the mass balance on control volume 2, I can say that the mass flow rate entering control volume 2, which is m.2, has to equal the mass flow rate at the exit, which is m.3. Similarly, I will just abbreviate that as m. Dot. The energy balance on control volume 2 could consist of these same terms. because it's still an open system. So I will duplicate those over as well. The only difference being that when I'm considering just the heating element, I don't have to account for any changes in kinetic energy. Furthermore, to clarify a little bit, I will call this power input term the power into the heater. So the change in kinetic energy across the heating element is zero. Therefore, the power into the heating element itself is going to be m.3 times h3 minus m.2 times h2 because it's the same mass flow rate. I can factor out the mass flow rate and write that as m dot times h3 minus h2. Two control volumes down, one more to go. The mass balance on control volume one has one inlet, it is state point one. It has one outlet, it is state point two. 
Therefore, I can write m.1 is equal to m.2. It's the same mass flow rate, which I can abbreviate m. Dot. For the energy balance on control volume 1, I can write that in much the same way, except this time I don't have any changes in enthalpy, because I'm assuming all of that happens in the heater. Furthermore, I will call this power input the power to the fan. And then I have power to the fan is equal to m.2 ke2 minus m.1 ke1, which is just m dot times ke2 minus ke1, which is v2 squared over 2 minus v1 squared over 2. And just like on control volume 3, the velocity of state 1 is 0. So I can simplify this down to just m dot times v2 squared over 2. So I have a power input to my heater of the mass flow rate through the heater times the delta H. And I have the power input to the fan as the mass flow rate through the fan times v2 squared over 2. And then because I know that both of those power terms have to come from the electrical socket, they must sum together to 1500 watts. We are assuming perfect efficiency and that power factor doesn't exist. So I could combine these together and write this as 1500 watts is equal to the power input to the fan plus the power input to the heater. And then make the substitutions. Power input to the fan was m dot times v2 squared over 2. Power input to the heater was m dot times h3 minus h2. I could simplify this by factoring out the mass flow rate, at which point I would have v2 squared over 2 plus h3 minus h2. And then if I wanted to simplify it all the way down to parameters that I was given directly, I could recognize that v2 is the same as v3 and write this as v3 squared over 2 and that h2 is equal to h1. Therefore, this would be h3 minus h1. And look, we have the same equation. If I solve this for the mass flow rate, I would have mass flow rate times, excuse me, mass flow rate equal to 1500 watts divided by v3 squared over 2 plus h3 minus h1. Look, it's the same. How neat is that? I think it's pretty neat. So regardless of which method we use to approach the problem, we end up at the same result. And I think that we have effectively stalled as much as possible. Now we actually have to start doing math. For that, I will jump onto a new page. And then just for simplicity's sake, I will copy this equation over. So, on page two, I can actually get to calculating things. The first thing I want to find is the mass flow rate. For that, I'm going to have to actually evaluate a delta H. I know V3, I know the power input, I know V1 is zero. So all I have to do is evaluate delta H and I am home free to calculate the mass flow rate. For my evaluation of delta H, remember that I have three options. The first option is to look up the H's in my property tables and subtract them directly. The second option would be to determine how the specific heat capacity of air changes as a function of temperature and evaluate it by using the definition for Cp, which is dH dt for ideal gases. Remember that when we're talking about changes in enthalpy of an ideal gas, 
it is CPDT, because that's defined with respect to enthalpy. It has nothing to do with the pressure being constant or not constant. H goes to P, U goes with V. The UDT is CV. Harry Potter, ultraviolet. If I knew how CP varied as a function of temperature for air, I could evaluate that integral, and I could make it even easier by assuming it didn't change. In that case, when I write dH is equal to CPDT, and I integrate both sides, and I get delta H on the left, if I assume CP is constant, it comes out of the integral, and I'm left with CP times delta T. That's even easier. So, option one, look up H's and subtract them. Option two, I try to be a little bit organized about this. Option two, I guess that's actually H3, not H2. Option two would be to look up CP as a function of T and integrate. Option three is to assume the specific heat capacity doesn't change, at which point it comes out of the integral. So those are the options that I could do. The real question is what I should do. Option one would yield the best answer under these circumstances. Option two would yield a pretty good answer. Option three would yield a worse answer. But I recognize that I have an ideal gas. I'm making a lot of simplifications for this problem. Like for example, assuming that there's no heat loss and that all the energy conversion happens perfectly. Those simplifications end up with uncertainty in our answer that is much, much bigger than the difference between any of these options. As a result, I might as well use the fastest one, which is option three. But in the interest of character building, and since we have effectively infinite time on the internet, let's do all three, shall we? Yeah, I think that sounds like fun. So for option one, I want to look up H1 and H3 using my property tables. For that, I recognize that I actually have ideal gas properties of air on table A22, so I will jump over to table A22, and I can look up the enthalpy for a given temperature. Remember that for ideal gases, U and H are only functions of temperature. So H1 will be the enthalpy of air at T1, And T1 was 22 degrees Celsius. 22 degrees Celsius plus 273.15 is going to be 295.15. You can verify that with a calculator. Just because I don't really trust my mental math at the moment. Yep, 295.15. And in my ideal gas property tables, I see that I don't have 295.15. I have 295. Now... Because I don't have an exact value, the best thing to do would be to interpolate. Now, 295.15 is like close enough to 295 to probably be okay with using 295. But, you know, I think in the interest of character building, we should actually evaluate that interpolation. So, what I'm going to do is take 295.15 minus 295. I'm going to divide that by 300 minus 295, and that's equal to... And the enthalpy at 295.15, which is what we're looking for, minus the enthalpy at 295, which is 295.17, divided by the enthalpy at 300, which is 300.19, minus the enthalpy at 295, which is 295.17. And we're looking for x, and we get 295.321. 
So H1 is about 295.321. We can repeat the same procedure for the enthalpy at T3. That was 50 degrees Celsius, if I'm not mistaken. Yep, 50. So we want 50 degrees Celsius. 50 plus 273.15 is 323.15, I think. But let's double check that with the calculator. 50 plus 273.15. Hey, look at that. Surprising everyone, the mental math was correct. So we find 323.15. Surely we have a direct row for that. Oh man, we don't. Oh no. I guess we have to interpolate again. Well, luckily for us, this is a good opportunity for character building. So 323, that doesn't start with a two. 323.15 minus 320 divided by 325 minus 320 is equal to the thing that we're looking for. Nope, that's not an equals. Come on, calculator, keep up. The thing that we're looking for minus the enthalpy at 320, which was 320.29. Divided by the enthalpy at 325, which was 325.31, minus the enthalpy at 320, which was 320.29. We are looking for x, and we get 323.45. So, 323.453. Let's use all those decimals, just to be as certain as we possibly can be. So with H1 and H3, we can subtract the 2, if my calculator cooperates, 323.453 minus 295.321, and we get 28.132. So our delta H, using option 1, came out to be 28.132. For option two, we are going to have to try to figure out a correlation between CP and temperature for ideal air. For that, I can look at table A21. So table A21 gives me lines of best fit for the specific heat capacity divided by the molar gas constant for a variety of gases as a function of temperature. So I would have to solve for the molar CP by multiplying by the universal gas constant and then evaluating that integral. That seems like fun. So assuming that I remember to go in and speed that up, you guys can see that I just copied over the constants, these coefficients, for air. Remember that these are not actually the constants. The value given in the table is beta times 10 to the third. So in order to write beta in our equation, we actually have to write 1.337 times 10 to the negative third. Likewise for gamma, instead of writing 3.294, we write 3.294 times 10 to the negative sixth. So with this fourth order polynomial, I get an approximate function for CP of air as a function of temperature. We can integrate that in order to plug that into our delta H. But for that integral, I would yield the molar specific heat capacity, which means that I would get the molar specific enthalpy. So in order to actually write the mass specific heat capacity, I have to take the molar specific heat capacity and divide it by the molar mass of air, which means that I'm actually going to be taking the universal gas constant, 8.314, divided by the molar mass for air, which I can get from table A1. On table A1, I see that it's 28.97. And then I'm multiplying that by 
this function to get the mass specific heat capacity. So when I do that integral, I can bring out the molar specific gas constant and the mass constant for air, and I will get out a delta H term. You excited? I'm excited. Let's do some calculus. And by we, I of course mean, let's make my calculator do some calculus for us. So if I pop up my calculator and I write out front, I have, come on calculator, parentheses, you can do it. Out front, I have 8.314 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, excuse me, kilojoules per kilomole Kelvin, divided by 28.97 kilograms per kilomole, which will yield a result in kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. And then I'm multiplying that by, let's grab an integral. We're going to integrate this lovely function, 3.653 plus the quantity 1.337 times 10 to the negative third, e negative three, negative three, much more better, times temperature, which is, I'm going to call x for now. x, there we go, much more better. Plus 3.294. 3.294 e negative sign not minus times x squared plus negative 1.913. Oh man, did I remember the right negative? Let's jump out to that first term. Did I write negative or did I write? I didn't write anything, man. Nope. Okay. Negative sign, not minus sign. Much more better. Look at all those negatives. And then over here, I have negative 1.913 times 10 to the negative ninth. Negative sign, not minus sign. Times x caret 3. Beautiful. Plus 0 0.2763. E to the negative sign, 12, times x to the fourth. That's my entire function. Close parenthesis. We are integrating with respect to x, and we are integrating from 22 degrees Celsius, which, remember that when we looked at these correlations, what we are talking about is temperatures in Kelvin. So even though it doesn't really matter when we're talking about linear temperature differences, it might matter in the exponentials here. So I will write that as 22 plus 273.15, and then 50 plus 273.15, and we get nothing. Cool. Did I integrate with respect to 22? How did that happen? Come on, calculator. I don't want to integrate with respect to 22. I want to integrate with respect to x. Much more better. Okay. Calculator, if you would be so kind. We get 28.1295. And even the calculator thinks that we have questionable accuracy. Awesome. So, delta H of... 28.1295 kilojoules per kilogram. Now, option two is a lot of work. It's actually more work than option one, and it's less accurate because it's using a line of best fit. I don't think that option two is really ever useful when we're talking about ideal gas properties of air. If we actually want to be accurate, we will use the actual enthalpies. If we are approximating, we will assume the specific heat capacity is constant. Option two is trying to be unnecessarily precise with an approximate method, and I don't think it's worth our time to even try. So on an exam, with me at least, I will never ask you to compute a delta H or a delta U using option two. But if you're curious about how that would work, now we've done it. Okay. Now for option three, we're assuming CP is constant. And we are going to look up the CP value for air 
on table A22. No. On table A20. For air at a halfway point between 22 and 50. Let's see. Halfway between 22 and 50 is going to be like 37. Here. Let's let the calculator do the math. We get 36. That's <laughs> more like it. 36 plus 273.15. The halfway point between 20 and 50 is going to be 309.15. Therefore, we should be using a CP value of air at 309.15. Now, we could probably make an argument for the fact that we're approximating anyway. We might as well just grab 300 instead of 309.15, but unnecessary precision is the name of the game at the moment. I can evaluate an interpolation here by writing 309.15 minus 300 divided by 350 minus 300 is equal to the thing that we're looking for minus the value at 300 which is 1.005 divided by the value at 350 which is 1.008 minus the value at 300 which is 1.005 and we get we we get 1.00555 So, 1.00555. And again, this is more accurate than I would expect you to be on an exam. If you were taking one of my exams, it would be totally fine to assume the CP of air is constant at 300, because it's the closest row that you have, since you're approximating anyway, might as well just approximate. There's no point in being that precise about an approximate method. But, you know, we're really exploring all of our options here. Therefore, delta H would be that CP value that we just calculated, 1.00555 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, multiplied by our temperature change between states 3 and 1, which is going to be 50 minus 22. Degrees Celsius cancels Kelvin here because a temperature change in degrees Celsius is the same as a temperature change in Kelvin. I mean, you could think of it like we can add 273.15 to both of these and we'll still get 38 or whatever. I mean, since we're here and we have infinite time, we might as well just try that. 50 minus 22 is 28. <laughs> 28, not 38. Well done on the mental math. John, this is why we have a calculator. And then 50 plus 273.15 minus 22 plus 273.15. See, we still get 28. That's why degrees Celsius and Kelvin cancel when they are a temperature difference. So 1.00555 times our 28 value gives us 28.1554. No, 28. 0.1554. So being real extra accurate yielded a delta H of 28.132. Being very approximate gives us 28.155. A difference of two hundredths ish. That's well less than the amount of error that we introduced by other approximations that we made throughout our solution. Again, things like the assumption that we have perfect energy conversion, that we have no losses whatsoever, that there is no heat transfer out through the nacelle body of the hairdryer. All of those are going to affect our answer way more than two hundredths of a kilojoule per kilogram, which is why in these circumstances it would be downright encouraged to just use this value but you know sometimes worth looking stuff up in tables just to be extra certain as a result of having this number already we might as well just use it if you were doing this on an exam you could totally use this value or better yet you can actually just grab the cp value at 300 which is 1.005 and ignore that extra interpolation just for funsies here 
that produces a value of 28.14. So you could totally use 28.14 instead of 28.132. But you know what? We have the number. Let's use the number. Now, <laughs> plugging that into our mass flow rate calculation, which I almost forgot we were doing. It's been so long since we talked about it. We can take 1500 watts and divide that by 28.132 plus the velocity at state 3, which was 20 meters per second. Yes. 20 meters per second. I'm going to square that and divide by 2, so I'm going to write 20 squared meters squared per second squared divided by 2. Then I recognize that I need to add that to kilojoules per kilogram. Therefore, I'm going to want to convert from meters squared per second squared to kilojoules per kilogram. To do that, I'm going to start with kilojoules and work backwards. A kilojoule is a thousand joules. A joule is a newton times a meter. And a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. Newton cancels newton. Joules cancels joules. Kilograms cancels nothing. Meters and meters cancel square meters, second squared cancels second squared, leaving me with kilojoules per kilogram. So therefore, if I take 28.132 plus 20 squared divided by 2000, I will get the denominator of this calculation. Generally speaking, I am a proponent of doing arithmetic as few times as possible, so I would probably continue to do the unit conversions after this resulting sum, but just to make it a little bit easier to follow, let's do it as two separate steps. So I'm going to calculate just the denominator first. 28.132 plus 20 squared, 20 carat 2 divided by 2,000. And we get 28.332. So we are taking 1,500 watts divided by 28.332 kilojoules per kilogram. And we are looking for an answer in kilograms per second because that's what part A is asking us for. Therefore, we need to write a kilojoule is a thousand joules and that a watt is a joule per second. Joule cancels joules, kilojoules cancels kilojoules, watts cancels watts, leaving me with kilograms per second. So now I'm going to take in my calculator, if it cooperates, 1500 divided by 28.332 times 1000 and we get 0 0.053. Look at that. Part A done. Now, part B asks for the volumetric flow rate at the outlet of the device. For the volumetric flow rate, we are going to involve the mass flow rate that we just calculated and a density term. Mass flow rate can be expressed as density times volumetric flow rate. So because we're looking for volumetric flow rate, we can take mass flow rate and divided by density. You could also think of that as taking mass flow rate times specific volume because specific volume and density are reciprocals of one another. The density is going to come from our ideal gas law. PV is equal to MRT. Remember this is the mass specific gas constant which is the universal gas constant divided by the molar mass. So I can write density, which is mass divided by volume, is equal to pressure divided by gas constant times temperature. And then in the interest of doing arithmetic as few times as possible, I'm going to make all of these substitutions symbolically. Specific gas constant for air is equal to universal gas constant divided by the molar mass of air. Universal gas constant comes from the inside of the front cover of our textbook. 
and is 8.314 kilojoules per kilomole Kelvin. And the molar mass of air comes from table A1, which is 28.97 kilograms, excuse me, 28.97 kilograms per kilomole. So when I make this substitution for my volumetric flow rate, I'm going to write this as that shiny new mass flow rate from part A divided by pressure times gas constant times temperature. So I had, what was that, 0 0.052944, you know, just to be arbitrarily precise, kilograms per second, and then universal gas constant was 8.314 kilojoules per kilomole Kelvin, and we're dividing that by molar mass, which was 28.97 kilograms per kilomole and then we are multiplying by temperature since we're talking about the volumetric flow rate at the outlet we're talking about the volumetric flow rate with the mass flow rate at the outlet and the density at the outlet which means that we're using the pressure at the outlet and the temperature at the outlet since the mass flow rate is the same everywhere it doesn't matter but it does matter for temperature and pressure the temperature at the outlet was 50 degrees Celsius, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, and then the inlet temperature was 22. The outlet pressure and the inlet pressure are both 100 kilopascals. So 50 plus 273.15 Kelvin divided by 100 kilopascals. Now, kilomoles cancels kilomoles. Kilograms cancels kilograms. Kelvin cancels Kelvin. For kilojoules and kilopascals to cancel, I need to expand them a little bit. A kilopascal can be expressed as a kilonewton per square meter. And a kilojoule can be expressed as a kilonewton times a meter. Kilonewton cancels kilonewtons. Kilojoules cancels kilojoules. Kilopascals cancels kilopascals. I have cubic meters in the numerator. I have seconds in the denominator, which is a volumetric flow rate. But remember, the problem wants an answer in CFM, which is cubic feet per minute. So we have to convert from cubic meters into cubic feet and from seconds into minutes. So first, I can find the conversion for length, 1 meter is 3.2808 feet, so I will write 1 meter, 3.2808 feet, and then I will cube everything. 1 cubed is 1, meters cubed cancels cubic meters and cubic meters, and then I need the seconds to become minutes. So there are 60 seconds in one minute. Seconds cancels seconds. And then, just to be consistent here, I will write a CFM is a cubic foot per minute. So that minute cancels minutes and cubic feet cancels cubic feet, leaving me with CFM. So, let me zoom out a little bit here. Man, that's going to be hard to see with a calculator. Okay, well, we can suffer through. Calculator, if you would please turn on. We have 0 0.052944 times 8.3. That's 8.314. Multiplied by 50 plus 273.15. Multiplied by 3.2808 cubed. Multiplied by 60. And we are taking that entire numerator and dividing it by 28.97 multiplied by 100 multiplied by 1 cubed, which is 1. And I get 104.033. Now, where to write that? Let me do a little bit of cleaning here. Scooch this up again, technical term. 
Then I can write the volumetric flow rate at the outlet. I can write um, the volumetric flow rate at the outlet is 104.033. With part B done, I can calculate part C. For that, I will go to a third sheet of paper. Part C wants to know what the diameter of the outlet should be. So I have a velocity at the outlet, I have a volumetric flow rate at the outlet, I can use that information to calculate a cross-sectional area, which if I have a circular outlet means I can calculate a diameter. So my volumetric flow rate can be expressed as average velocity. I can denote an average velocity as opposed to the velocity at any point. If we were talking about a more representative velocity profile at the outlet, it would be a little bit higher at the center and a little bit slower toward the edges, but we're calling velocity here an average. And then we are multiplying by cross-sectional area. We can express the cross-sectional area of a circle as pi over 4 times diameter squared. And then I can write that as velocity squared times pi times diameter squared divided by 4. I know the velocity at the exit, it's 20 meters per second. I know the volumetric flow rate at the end, exit, it's 104.033 cubic meter, excuse me, cubic feet per second, cubic feet per minute. I know pi, I know 4, so diameter is just going to be the square root of 4 times volumetric flow rate divided by velocity at the exit times pi. So we could go back into our volumetric flow rate calculation and get rid of the conversion at the end to imperial. I mean, we could just knock off those two components at the end, which were three point two eight oh eight cubed and sixty. Or we could handle that unit conversion backwards. Or we can actually just substitute in the equation that we used to calculate volumetric flow rate in the first place inside of this calculation. It doesn't really matter which method we use. Theoretically, if I kept track of enough decimal places, they should all be equivalent. But just to be representative of the sort of work that someone might do if they had a limited amount of time on an exam and they had already calculated a volumetric flow rate in CFM, let's do the unit conversions from CFM back to whatever it is we need to get an answer in inches. So I have four, I have 104.033. That was 104.033, John. Three, three, and then with that, I can put my calculator away for a moment. And that was cubic feet per minute. And I'm dividing by the velocity of the exit, which was 20 meters per second. I'm going to go double check that. 20 meters per second. And I'm going to divide by pi. And then I'm going to perform whatever unit conversions I need so that when I take the square root at the end, I get inches out. So in order to get inches out as the answer for diameter, I need everything under the radical to be inches squared. So I need to get cubic feet times seconds per minute times meters to become square inches. So first of all, I recognize that one minute is 60 seconds, at which point minute cancels minute, seconds cancels second. Next, I represent one foot as being 12 inches, and then I cube everything. Or perhaps square everything is a little bit easier. Yeah, because we have the conversion from meters to feet. Yeah, let's do that. Square everything. One squared is one. Inches squared is what I want to get to. Square feet cancels two of the three feet in the cubic feet on the left. And then I write one meter is 3.2808 feet, which again comes from this conversion on the inside of the front cover. And then meters cancels meters, square feet and feet cancels cubic feet, and I have square inches. So when I take the square root of a quantity in square inches, I will get out an answer in inches. So, 
calculator, if you would be so kind. I will write that as 4 times 104.033 times 12 squared. All divided by 20 times 60 times 1 squared, which is 1 times 3.2808. And then I take that entire quantity raised to the 1 half power. And I get 3.9. Let's double check that all of our numbers appear. 4 appears, 104.033 appears, 12 squared appears, 20 appears, 60 appears, 3.2808 appears. Awesome. So for diameter at the outlet, it should have 3.9 inches in diameter. And that's everything we need to answer the question.